Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our session for the Aspire Fellowship. My name is Sara Rodriguez, and I am the program coordinator for the West Texas Research Collaborative, as well as for the ELSEM program. And it is my pleasure to join us today and um, join everybody today in this information session that we hope encourages you to apply for our fellowship opportunity and also gives you an overview of our program and what we've done to date. So in respect to everybody's time, and since we already have 11 participants logged on, let's begin. And I would like to introduce you to Dr. Benjamin Flores, who is our director and principal investigator. Dr. Flores. Thank you, Sara, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Aspire Fellowship Program. This is an initiative that is funded by the National Science Foundation. And Sara, if you could move on to the next slide. Let me just say a few things about uh, the reason why we have this program. Um, we have seen over the years that community colleges across the United States uh, have evolved. Um, I should also add that community colleges are an American invention. Uh, uh, they are seen as an opportunity uh, to uh, give people uh, access to higher education. Uh, it is of course, uh, of great importance right now because most of the students that participate uh, in higher education start at community colleges. And more importantly, those individuals who want to pursue a career in uh, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics disciplines are uh, individuals who really want to excel and they they have an opportunity to do so in a community college environment. Um, the STEM workforce is growing and there's great demand for more individuals who are prepared in these disciplines. And of course, we need to have more people uh, well prepared to educate uh, the students who are enrolled in community colleges. So there has been over the years a shift uh, in enrollment uh, from four-year institutions to two-year institutions, uh, of which Gulf Coast Community Colleges are a part of. And they are a leading force in STEM education. So what our program wants to do, which is uh, within the scope of what uh, we call the Aspire Alliance, is to prepare graduate students to become future faculty and to explore uh, career options as much as they can, including careers in community colleges. So we expect that students who participate in this program will uh, consider it very seriously uh, pursuing a career uh, first as adjunct faculty at a community college and then eventually as a tenure track uh, professor. Uh, Sara, next. So our alliance is called the Aspire Alliance and we work under a cooperative agreement with the National Science Foundation uh, to collaborate with a number of institutions uh, in preparing an inclusive STEM faculty uh, who mirror the diverse community of students that they, that they serve. So in Texas, we have a collaborative uh, of two universities, the University of Texas at El Paso and the University of Texas Permian Basin as well as four community colleges in the region, uh, starting with El Paso Community College, but also Howard College, Midland College, and Odessa College. The last three institutions are all in the Permian Basin. So you can see that we have a number of stars in West Texas um, 
and these stars represent the institutions that are part of our alliance and our regional collaborative. Sara? So now we will have uh, Mr. Agni Prava Banerjee, who will talk to uh, our attendees about the program participation and how we've divided our student cohorts to date. Agni. Oh, yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, since 2019, when we've had the first uh, Aspire cohort, we've had three cohorts to date. Uh, so the first one was in 2019, and it had a variety of students who were selected uh, from uh, UTEP. We did have, we always have a large variety from the different disciplines, starting from biology to uh, chemistry to computer science. We've even had engineering, we've had environmental science and engineering, and a lot of different disciplines also. So for the second cohort, we had, uh, it was during the pandemic in 2020, and we did have uh, four students, they were selected from our other lead institution, which is the University of Texas at Permian Basin. We had students pursuing biology and chemistry during the second cohort. Uh, for our third cohort, we had, we included master's and doctoral students. Uh, as mentioned here, it was our first online cohort. And here's a picture depicting the various participants and the various faculty mentors from the different partnering to your institutions. We did have an even larger variety of different disciplines here, which included chemistry. It, we also had engineers. We also had people in geology. We even had uh, some students who were in teaching and learning, computational science, and et cetera. OK, uh, so now to uh, describe a little bit about the Aspire Fellowship Program. So this is our most recent poster for the Aspire Fellowship. Uh, we have tried to put some out in the bulletin boards and also distribute it. So you might be getting even more notifications over time. So in our fellowship program, each of the selected graduate students are paired uh, with the community college faculty to have a meaningful one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships. They learn about everything starting from the requirements, the responsibilities, and the different techniques of teaching, how to access the uh, classroom environment in a community college and et cetera, and also look at the possibility of a future career. So a few highlights from our program include a participation stipend of $1,500 per semester. Uh, there is also mentoring by a qualified community college professor as you saw, we do have a, a large number of four -year two year institutions, which are part of our cohort. So we go ahead and develop these one on one relationships. There are a large number of professional development activities and workshops. So a lot of them, they would include everything from the mission and the background of community colleges. There will be workshops on preparing uh, teaching philosophies, workshops on teaching the different sort of techniques, inclusive techniques in community college and et cetera. And finally, we do have a closing ceremony and there is, we provide a certification and also like a farewell uh, meeting. So uh, here we're gonna look at few of the previous testimonials. So uh, we do have a variety of testimonials. We have two from our different cohorts. The first one here is from uh, Jay English, he was uh, from the UT Permian Basin, and he was one of the first people who joined this cohort during the online transition. However, as you can see, he did receive a very good understanding of the online classes and also got a better understanding on how to transition into online classes and also how to prepare the various deliverables, uh, focusing on online and face-to-face -face learning. Then we also have an uh, example from Jocelyn, who was one of uh, our first cohort participants. And Jocelyn, uh, as he mentions here, she did not have a lot of exposure to the community college environment and more inclined towards the four-year college environment. However, this uh, fellowship gave her a better idea to the community college environment. 
and as completing her PhD, she is considering to try to move towards a faculty career in community colleges. Thank you, Agni. I would like to take a moment also to share the more specific activities or items that we put on our agenda. And this is taken from our previous cohort. And this is a layout basically of our calendar of activities once um, we have our cohort ready to go and our students are accepted. And excuse my, my voice, I've been sick, so it sounds a little bit off. So this is just a quick example. Um, so you are um, able to have a visual of how we lay out and prepare the semester. So I want to make a quick comment just to make sure that this is clarified because we do get this question a lot. This is not an academic opportunity and this is not a teaching, um, a teaching job or a paid job that requires teaching. This is a professional development opportunity that allows you to start networking and build your career and your path in order to um, land a future teaching job. So these are some of the activities. And I mentioned this um, because we do not offer academic credit. So I think this is worth um, clarifying from the start for those interested in applying that once you complete this you will not this is not reflected on your transcript another reason why we have this question is because we do have access to a blackboard session so as part of the aspire cohort we have a section in blackboard therefore it will appear as part of the classes that you're enrolled in so i just want to make that note that it's not tied to your grades even though we do grade the activities to provide you with feedback to improve that's the reason so this is an example of our calendar and as you can see we have weekly uh, lines or weekly um, activities, bi-weekly meetings and deliverables. So these marked in red are professional development sessions. As you can see, these are webinars. And in this case, applied to the 2021 situation, this was everything was online. We are hoping that if COVID permits, we will be able to have a hybrid cohort for the next semester. And this way we do have in-person sessions for some of the professional development activities that you can see on the screen. Okay, then the ones on green are one on one mentor meetings, and these are scheduled based on your availability and your mentors availability. So we do not um, interfere with those dates, you and your mentor will set those dates to make sure that by the dates that we require, you have completed a certain amount of meetings. So two of these are um, expected. We do have two classroom observations. And again, because of our situation last semester, we included these as part of um, the online observation session. So most of our colleagues were teaching online and some had synchronous or asynchronous sessions. So it was all a matter of being flexible leaders and understanding that we required um, this to make sure that the observations were completed for our fellows. So some were able to join the sessions at EPCC where their mentors were teaching virtually. And this was a great experience as Sagne was mentioning to make sure that we could um, incorporate the online teaching, um, I guess, to the portfolio, the online teaching challenges that we've presented with. And all of these um, have a deliverable which are encompassed in a final submission, a final teaching portfolio, which is basically the corrected or final versions of your previous activities once we've given you the feedback. So again, the teaching portfolio includes final versions of your observation reflections for those classroom observations, the meeting summaries, a teaching philosophy, which we workshop, and a lesson plan. So with this said, this is just a quick and very fast overview of the activities that you will be as an Aspire Fellow uh, required to complete in order to 
um, have a completion of our program, hence the repetition. So now I would like to leave the virtual floor to our community college liaisons or partners. And we have today in attendance, Professor and Dean Joshua Villalobos, Dr. Stephen Hobbs and Dr. Thomas Reddy. And they will be now sharing their expertise as community college faculty administrators and also as mentors and um, their vast experience uh, in other initiatives such as the LSAM program. So with further, with with no more further ado this, I will introduce Professor Joshua Villalobos, who's Dean of Mission El Paso at El Paso Community College. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, my name is Joshua Villalobos. I am Dean at the Mission Del Paso campus at El Paso Community College. Uh, this is my first semester um, working with Aspire Alliance. And I can tell you that as a proud graduate of UTEP through the geological sciences, um, a program like this would have been instrumental. It definitely would have helped me out to make that transition from um, UTEP to El Paso Community College when I was looking um, where I wanted to land my career. So um, being a part of this initiative is uh, extremely, um, I think, worthwhile for not only um, you, but also for, for us as uh, community college administrators. So I wanted to talk a little bit about El Paso Community College. Um, so we are a fairly large uh, community college. We have about 24,000 students um, on average. We have five campuses throughout El Paso County, so we serve pretty much the majority of the various regions um, in El Paso. And one of the things that we are noticing, especially in light of, of COVID, is we have a very high number of faculty who are now retiring. And so we're looking for opportunities as well as applicants to come to uh, try community colleges out. Um, we have a variety of different ways that people can uh, enter the community college um, from uh, being part-time. Uh, we also have opportunities within our dual credit and our early college high schools. Um, so that's another opportunity um, if you are looking for, for work within the independent school districts around El Paso. Um, in terms of what our requirements are for El Paso Community College, I mean, it's pretty much going to be standard throughout the state of Texas is we're looking for you to have a master's within the field that you are studying. Um, right now, we are uh, in, in need of several STEM fields, um, in particular biology, chemistry, and mathematics. So if you um, are a PhD student, you already have your master's, um, I, would, I would encourage you to visit our website, which is da, uh, jobs.epcc.edu. Um, or you can actually log on to our Facebook page. And we also have links to the various um, job postings we have there. So in regarding to if you do um, get a position here at EPCC, typically um, what we do is once you put in your application, we put in all of the required documentation. Um, oftentimes these positions pop up um, right before the semester starts. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time I mean, in terms of notifying individuals, but typically what begins to happen is as the semester starts and classes begin to fill, um, we begin to realize that a class will make and we need to find somebody who is not only qualified, but credentialable in order to be inside the classroom. Um, and sometimes people only have maybe a week, maybe a few days to actually prep for that first class. So an opportunity like this program where you'd be able to be mentored by a community college faculty member and participate in these types of workshops will definitely give you that heads up in terms of if you find yourself in that position where you um, are assigned a class at a very short notice. Um, so I, I highly recommend um, the workshops as well as the opportunity for you to find ways to teach. Um, teaching is not necessarily required for you to get a position at a community college, but it definitely makes things uh, much easier for you. And if you are interested in applying for a full-time tenure track position, um, that would definitely um, be to your advantage. So all the various things that I believe that this program is 
offers you um, not only sets you up for a potential part-time, but also further down the line for you to get into a full-time uh, tenure track position, um, in particularly at EPCC. Thank you so much, Professor Villalobos. Yes, and I do want to build on a little bit about that, just a quick comment, because one of the things that we always mention is that networking component. Um, that is a big part of the effort and the push for our students. And I think that when we when we see the results from the Aspire alumni, we can definitely see how 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 they're building those connections and making the choices to be better mentors themselves. So everything that that you said, yes, indeed. And also the fact that not only Professor Villalobos is our co-PI and liaison for EPCC, but he had the chance and great opportunity for us to be a mentor for our one of our students for the 2021 spring cohort. And that allowed him to share what he just mentioned. So thank you so much for that. And now I would like to bring to our virtual floor, Dr. Stephen Hobbs, who's chair and professor of math and science at Howard College, and also one of our colleagues for the LSAM program. So the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I am a professor of biology at Howard College. We are currently looking for a, a chemistry instructor. And just in case you have to be interested in chemistry, let me know. Uh, but with that, what we try to do is, is our college is a very rural college, which means that we've got relatively small classes. One thing that you'll notice that is a major difference between big universities and community colleges are generally the class sizes are about one tenth. They're much smaller. Um, in fact, we make a class at 10 students. So that's, that's our requirement. The one-on-one -on -one that you'll experience with a student here is absolutely life-changing. You may find a student who is very interested in STEM, but they feel like they can't be a scientist. They feel like they are, have been excluded for some reason. Pick a reason, there are thousands of them. But in our case, uh, we get students um, who don't have the opportunity to go somewhere else. So here in our very small town of you know, 30,000, we have 3,500 students. So we are teaching one-tenth of the entire population of Howard uh, each semester. So you can make some very big changes relatively quickly in people's lives. The reason why they can't leave is because maybe they've got a family, they have jobs, they've got mortgages and so on. They started life earlier than your traditional students. So we have a very large amount of non-traditional students. With non-traditional students, I personally believe that they are the best students on the planet ever. Now, the reason why I say that is because they have figured out what they don't want to do, but they may not know how to get where they want to be. So they come to Howard and we put them on the right path. They put them on pathway and, you know, set them up for success. That's what we want. Howard is a, is a stickler for SACS accreditation requirements. So you have to have 18 hours, a master's degree with 18 hours in that area that you're going to teach. So any STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, if you're in there, we're most likely going to have uh, a, uh, a position for you. The teaching requirements for a community college are generally 15 hours. So you're going to get, you know, uh, three lectures, three labs or so. And depending on which class and, and how many hours they're worth, of course, they're most likely going to be worth three hours uh, for a lecture and one hour for a lab. We do have the online component, of course. But with the online, what we have found, found is that our reach has increased dramatically, of course. I mean, it's the World Wide Web, of course. Um, but with that, it's not necessarily the fact that we are reaching further around the planet. It's the fact that we are in people's homes. They have brought us into their house. Even though we are a, a local school, we have people that haven't set a foot on our campus, but have learned from us the same high quality that we would offer somewhere else but we've offered it directly to them and a chance that in, in the case of you know, COVID, of course, asynchronous and synchronous, we did both at the same time. So we have to have you know, qualified candidates, we have to have faculty members that know what they're doing, but they don't have to focus on research. That's one of the things about our school. You can research and we do, many of us do, but it is not a major requirement. So what they do is they get to focus on teaching 
They get to focus on what they absolutely love. And for those that absolutely love teaching, the community college is a gold mine, really. It, you, you love your job and there's really nothing better than that. It's, it's less stress because you enjoy it. In my case, it's rural. It's very close to where I live. So I don't have to worry about traffic. My commute is a two minute walk at, at best. You know, even in the snow and ice, <laughs> I can still make it to work in about two minutes because I live across the street. Um, smaller colleges also have a bigger camaraderie. Yes, you can make friends at any university and you make lots of them. That network is absolutely vital, yes. But at a smaller college, when you have to rely on each other because you may be a single person um, program, that has happened multiple times here where we only had one instructor for a particular program for quite a few you know, years. You get to develop it. You get to expand your knowledge base. You're not always going to be in the, in the classroom teaching, of course, but that time where you're not, you want to try to make yourself better. You feel like you need to make yourself better. You do all the professional development. You, you uh, have the opportunity to link up with people in a completely different area, not science and chemistry or like biology and chemistry or, you know, chemistry and physics. We're not like allied health. Where would that come into play? And in, in my case, we actually started with physical education. So the, the coaching classes, we work really well together. We find out what the students need. We find out where they are and we can talk to each other because we're right next door. So community colleges offer an opportunity that to me, I have just absolutely fallen in love with. I love my job more than anything else. So people ask me all the time, why don't you stay? Why don't you go somewhere you know, much larger, somewhere not in the middle of the country? Because you know, I enjoy going to very, very large cities, you know, New York, Washington, DC, and so on. But I absolutely love where I work. I can travel anywhere. Keep that in mind when you're making a decision whether or not to work in a community college. You can go elsewhere, travel, feel free to do so. And you get the opportunity to do that because you're not stuck in the lab if you don't want to be. If you'd like to be, we have that opportunity too. So for that, if you are interested, send me a message. It's shobbs at howardcollege.edu. And I'll be happy to answer that for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hobbs. Those were great comments and um, information. Also, we have your emails, everybody's emails um, on the screen. I will share it in a second. But I would also like to say that that is very true regarding the community college and it ties back to what Dr. Flores was mentioning regarding the shift in the community colleges and as, as, as part of the workforce in our our society. And I think that's a great point because now community colleges are doing research. And even though it is not a requirement, as Dr. Hobbs mentioned, for a tenure track position, it is now something that's common practice among community colleges. So before, I know that many students, PhD students or master's students, were not encouraged to consider a teaching career at a two-year institution because of the lack of space for a research component in their career. And now that is also changing. So just consider that as another, another factor to favor that choice. So with that being said, we will have our next participant and guest speaker for this presentation, also part of the Aspire team great colleague and wonderful mentor, Dr. Tom Reddy from Midland College, who is a professor of chemistry, and he will share with you his experience as community college faculty administrator and mentor, Dr. Reddy. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're participating or exploring participating in the Aspire program. Much of uh, what I uh, I would say has already been covered by uh, Dr. Villalobos and uh, Dr. Hobbs. I might emphasize slightly uh, some other points with some subtleties, uh, but it's uh, basically I'm going to be repeating some of what's already been said. Millen College is uh, considered a rural institution. Uh, the city of Midland is about 250,000. 
Midland College uh, is somewhere between uh, six and 5,000 students. And so we're considered a small college in a rural setting. Uh, that being said, uh, we uh, think of ourselves as a, a metropolitan area because we're one of the larger towns in the Permian Basin. So uh, when you consider becoming a faculty at a community college, uh, one of the first things you need to ask yourself, and this is kind of an existential question, is what do you want out of life? And that may be a multifaceted answer. It may not be just a black and white answer, single answer. So one of the considerations is money, of course. Money is the grease that makes the wheels turn. And so it's, it's important to our lives. Is that the most important thing in your prospective career? Is money all that you care about? If that's true, then community college career is probably not what you wanna pursue. You're not gonna make a lot of money being a professor at a community college. You'll make a good li living, but it's not gonna be a, a high standard living. Uh, do you care about helping people? Uh, do you care about making a difference in people's lives? If that's something that is important to you, then a community college is a place where that you can make a big impact and make a big impact immediately. Uh, do you want time off from your work? Uh, if you work in industry, uh, you might get two weeks vacation a year. That may be enough for you. Uh, but some people uh, like to have a little bit more time off. Well, if you like to have extended periods of time off, a community college might be a good place for you because uh, we get all of the holidays that students do. So uh, it depends on what you want in life and I think teaching at a community college is one of the best decisions I ever made. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the quality of life at a community college is unlike uh, what you will experience at any university. It, it, in many ways, it's more like a family. And quality of life means that you can enjoy life. You're, uh, yes, there's times where there's pressure, but relatively speaking, it's a low pressure job. Your main goal is to teach. That is your sole responsibility. Uh, can you do research at a community college? Absolutely, you can. And, uh, I will probably talk a lot more about that uh, in future meetings, but yes, you can do research and uh, it's exciting, but you don't have to do research. If you work at a university, you're gonna spend uh, at least 50% of your time writing grants to try to get research money. That is a major focus of your uh, academic job at a university. And at a community college, that is not part of your job description. You do not have to write grants. Your main focus is teaching. And so uh, the research is uh, an option. It's not a requirement. Uh, do you get paid for doing research at a community college? No. In most cases, you do not. You don't get any extra money for doing it. You have to do it on your own time. So you really gotta love research in order to do it. 
at a community college. It's, it's not the way that you make money. It's you do it because it's part of your being. And so I love community colleges because uh, I get to do research. I get to make an impact on uh, people at community colleges. And uh, this may seem uh, far-fetched, but you really can change the world in a, a small way. Most of the students, most of the students are uh, non-traditional students. And a lot of them are first-generation college students. They uh, need extra help navigating uh, higher education. And some people uh, might say that that's needy. Uh, I don't like that word. Uh, they are people that just need help navigating. And since they're first generation, uh, they are taking a step up on the ladder to make a better life for themselves and a better life for their family. So you're not only helping the individuals that you're in, that are in your class, you're helping their children because if their parents become college graduates, their children are much, 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 much more likely to go to college. So you're helping multiple generations with each class of students that you teach. And in that way, uh, you can really make an impact on people's uh, lives, on the economy and uh, the health of our nation. So uh, I hope to talk with all of you in much more detail. Uh, you can contact me at my email is T ready, R E A D Y, at midland.edu. And I hope that all of you decide to join the program. I think you'll, uh, it'll benefit you uh, whether you decide to go to a community college or even a four-year university. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, I hope to meet all of you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that heartfelt comment and sharing of all of that, which is true aside from the technicalities and the specifics that we go over our webinar. It's also great to remember why we do what we do. And my voice is not breaking because I'm getting emotional. It's breaking because I'm getting over a cold. But that was very heartfelt. And I agree because in the end, that's why we do what we do to make this place a better place. So part of our community college liaison members that is not in attendance today is Professor Contreras, who has also been a mentor for our Aspire students. And um, we hope that you can testify to his expertise in one of our future sessions. And just a quick presentation and, and, and cap of what the lead team is. We accept, with the exception of Dr. Montes, um, we have been in attendance today and you see Dr. Flores, Professor Villalobos, Agni, Agni Prava Vanerje and myself. And we thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to leave the floor to Dr. Flores to address some questions and also to do a quick recap so we can um, move on. Dr. Flores. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sarah. And I want to thank each one of our speakers uh, profusely for, for your insight on uh, what it means to be an educator in a community college. Again, the take home message for everybody is to uh, apply. We have a deadline coming up on December 17th. If you're interested in this program, if you are interested in exploring uh, faculty opportunities, a career as a professor in a community college, this program is for you. 
we are funded by the National Science Foundation. And our goal is to make sure that you feel by the end of the spring semester, uh, having enough experience to feel confident that you will be successful in applying and getting a faculty position at a community college. The program also prepares you for uh, a teacher education or our education as a professor in higher education in general. But what you get out of this program is a one-on-one -on -one intervention. You will be mentored by a professor from a community college. You will have an opportunity to think about the details of what it takes to be a successful educator in that type of environment. And as you have heard from our guest speakers, the environment is very different than what you would encounter in a university that has a residential or even a commuter uh, student population. Uh, these are people who care deeply about the education of individuals who are interested in STEM. And as I mentioned before, the large majority of our, of our students in the nation start at a community college. So I think it's a great place for uh, graduate students uh, and junior faculty to start their careers as well. So uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, you can always email us at aspire at utip.edu. But if you have questions right now, you can open your microphone or you can just type your questions in the chat room. I do want to thank uh, Olivas, Mr. Olivas, for uh, providing feedback regarding the, you know, what Dr. Hobbs uh, indicated, you know, his passion for uh, being an educator in a yeah, community college. So any questions whatsoever for our speakers or for us, the people in the program? Hello, uh, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. This is Abir and I am a PhD student in the mechanical engineering department here at UTEP. Hi, Abib. Hello. So uh, I'm an international student. So I came from Bangladesh and I am pursuing my PhD here at UTEP. So what kind of opportunities does the community college offer to the international students? That's a great question. And, you know, I can tell you from experience that I, I have seen uh, a large number of individuals who uh, come from abroad uh, pursue careers in community colleges. Uh, there are places where, you know, that's just the norm, uh, you know, but, you know, if you're interested in, in a position, you just need to be aware of what the responsibilities are and you have started hearing about that. But I will let uh, my colleagues also interject their thoughts. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Reddy here, and I can tell you that uh, depending, you know, every community college is different. Uh, it, it's every community college is different. Their needs are different. So um, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but depending on the need in their particular field of endeavor, so, so let's say engineering, if a community college really needs an engineering professor, uh, then they can find a way uh, for you to get a, uh, a visa and a sponsorship. Uh, if they don't need an engineering professor badly, uh, then they, they may not <laughs> be a sponsor. So uh, it really depends on the location and their need. I can tell you uh, that the community colleges represented here all have a high emphasis on uh, diversity in the faculty. Uh, our uh, president and our vice president just uh, last 
uh, semester re-emphasize that new hires, uh, they're going to really look hard at diversifying and maintaining the diversity of our faculty at Millen College. I'm sure it's exactly the same way at El Paso Community College and uh, uh, the other institutions. So uh, that's what I would say. Uh, you, you need to explore uh, individual institutions and see who really needs your field of expertise. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for your answer. Well, I just want to uh, jump in and, and also um, state that, uh, unfortunately, especially if it's a part-time uh, position, uh, EPCC typically doesn't um, sponsor, uh, help sponsor for the working visa. But if you have a working visa, um, like Mr. Reddy said, um, we're more than happy to, to bring you on board. We have several um, uh, faculty members, especially part-time faculty members um, who are on working visas. So that, that's not a problem whatsoever. I think the, the, the problems do arise when, when we're asked to, to sponsor um, uh, for particular working visas, which is very, very difficult for us to do at EPCC. Okay. So uh, just to add to my question, I mean, the fellowship that is on offer, is it uh, restrict the internationals, US citizen, or it's open for everyone? Agni, that's yours. Uh, okay, uh, so to answer your question, yes, our fellowship is open for everyone. However, due to the National Science Foundation guidelines, the only difference would be that uh, non-US citizens or permanent residents will not be eligible for this stipend. However, every other portion of the fellowship will stay exactly the same. I would like to add, like in our previous cohort was one of the first time we introduced or uh, fellows who are not US citizens, we refer to them as associate fellows. And last time we had a considerable, I think more than six to seven uh, students from different PhD backgrounds who were international students. And they joined in at associate fellows and they had a really great experience, uh, you know, doing this cohort. They were from every, like from engineering, they were from biology, chemistry, also from environmental sciences. And so you are more than welcome to apply and be a part of the 2022 cohort. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Diana. Diana, you raise your hand. Yes. Hi, can you guys Hi. see me? No. We can, yes. I can't see myself. Oh, that's weird. Okay, um, I have a question. So, uh, I have my master's in science uh, with biology. I finished a thesis. I applied for a job at EPCC and I, I got a part-time position in another campus. So qualify for this fellowship. Have you finished your degree already? Yeah. yeah. When did yeah. you finish? Uh, spring 2021. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want to participate in the program, you're more than welcome. Okay. And you, to, 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 you can apply. Okay. Uh, again, we are probably going to uh, limit the fellowships to individuals who are enrolled at the university oh, I'm, here I'm, at UTEP, here oh, at UTEP or, or UT Permian Basin. But oh, go ahead. Enrolled um, as a PhD student. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we'll consider you for sure. Awesome, thank you, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from, from the group? There was a raised hand, by, but uh, Mr. Cano said that the previous answer answered his question, so. Okay, great, great. Well, I, I, can, I think I can add a little bit more to the, to the initial question that I have. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Jaime, I'm also from oh. the mechanical, uh, department. I'm doing my PhD. Uh huh. Hi, uh, How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. So I actually had a question on the development, the professional development itself. For example, well, I've seen a lot of uh, tenure track for, for example, opportunities that they've been requiring a lot more on the understanding on the diver diversity and equity 
and and all of this. Correct. Uh, I've seen that it's been a it's been a huge push on on that area. So I just wanted to know if the, the in the professional development if I could be able to obtain uh, some knowledge or get deeper insight on on those diversity th those diversity requirements that most universities are requiring nowadays. Correct. Correct. I, I think I know where you're coming from. Uh, one of the things that we're going to emphasize this coming semester is uh, the concept of inclusive learning. That is to make sure that we reach out to everybody regardless of their background, but also to acknowledge their background and to be as uh, influential as possible to make sure that the students are successful. So the answer, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that we will spend time discussing uh, uh, inclusive uh, teaching and uh, also making sure that you get an opportunity to see the diversity of the student population in community colleges, okay? So you don't necessarily have to be matched with a professor from EPCC. You could also be matched with, with a professor from, from another uh, community college like uh, Midland College or Howard College or Odessa College. The important thing here is that you have access and then you can start network with networking with your professor and uh, getting a deeper understanding of, of what it is to work in a community college. Does that answer your question, Jaime? Yes, thank you very much. And also thank you very much, Dr. Hofsai. I saw your, your message. See, we're just jumping in joy here. We just wanna make sure that everybody is in the edge right now, you know, realizes uh, that we really wanted to participate in this program. Yes, and that goes to other interested students who would like to apply but are unsure because of their student status as Ms. Olivas or due to residency or, or citizenship. We welcome everybody from every graduate background, because this is a formative experience and a professional development experience, the contingency is who is eligible for the funding. But again, that does not that does not mean that you cannot apply and be part of a program as an associate fellow and get access to, to these experiences and to all of the resources that we have. So another thing to mention is that as a repository of information that we bring to our fellows, we do have articles, book chapters, and many other uh, literature um, and materials that deal with current issues in higher education. So maybe that Mr. Cano will be something to look into. And also, as Dr. Flores mentioned, we are we are going to make this something more tangible in our conversation, as well as online teaching and its challenges, because it is what we have right now. So that is something that we're also incorporating into our program to make sure we address it and we have our fellows prepared for for those challenges. So thanks for all your questions. Is there anything else that anybody uh, would like to ask or comment? If if um, if you have questions regarding the specifics of the application, I pasted the link in the chat and that is aspire2022.questionpro.com. And you can find there the specifications. And again, the reminder, the deadline is the 17th. So. Dr. Flores, do we have anything else? Well, I just want to thank uh, all of our participants and uh, also our guest speakers for their valuable input. Uh, as always, I every time that we have this distinguished group of uh, folks from all over Texas, we learn something new, and uh, you know we begin to appreciate them even more. So thank you for your participation and uh, stay in touch, everybody. Uh, let's make sure that you submit your applications. If you have questions, you know how to reach us. If you want to talk to us a little bit more, don't feel uh, that we're gonna be apprehensive about this, rather uh, it's gonna be quite the opposite. You have our contact information, so uh, 
to contact us anytime you wish. Okay. So have a great weekend, everybody. Stay safe. Get your booster shots if you haven't got those yet. And we'll be talking to you soon. You all take care. Bye-bye, everybody.